You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. No matter what you may think of the way the presidential vote counting dispute was settled, everyone seems to agree the way we cast and count ballots needs serious review and reform. As a friend pointed out to me, you can tell what we think is really important. On the one hand, when it comes to counting votes, it has been revealed that for years, in many jurisdictions, not just Florida, we have settled for what can only be described as rough approximations of results. But when it comes to reconciling monthly bank statements, Fifth, Third, and First Star are not satisfied with rough approximations that come within, oh, you know, 10 or 15 dollars. They insist we get it to the penny, and they have the personnel and the computer systems to figure it out. Ultimately, elections are state responsibilities, and the point person in each state is the Secretary of State. In Ohio, the current Secretary of State is Ken Blackwell. Ken has served as a Cincinnati City Councilman and as a mayor. In the administration of President Bush, he worked as an Undersecretary at HUD and as an Ambassador to the United Nations. Before serving as Secretary of State, he served as Ohio's Treasurer. And Ken and I go back long enough that I even remember when you called yourself a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome uh, to Newsmakers, Ken. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got the goods on you. Uh, <laughs> indiscretions of youth. <laughs> yeah, indiscretions of youth. Uh, anyway, I know you were down in Florida uh, with any... Uh, Besides even being down in Florida, you were in communications with the Bush team as soon as the election was over. What was it you were doing? What were your responsibilities? What did you try to do to, to help out? Well, first, I wanted to take advantage of what evolved as a, a major history and civics lesson for, for, for the nation. Uh, but for the Bush campaign, essentially what I tried to do was to go down and, and explain the mechanics of the punch card system. Uh, where it was reliable, where it was questionable, and to look for ways to making sure that their argument centered on a fundamental principle, I think that's tied to the vibrancy of our democracy, that each vote must be measured consistently and weighed equally. That is a principle that is paramount to public confidence in our election returns. Now, obviously where the, the, the most questions came was with the punch card systems in South Florida. How do those punch card systems, the way people vote, the way they're counted, are they, we use punch cards here in Southwest Ohio. Um, are they similar? Are they exactly the same? Are they different in any important respects? What did you find? How did these two systems compare? Well, the machines themselves are very, very similar. In Ohio, we have 88 counties. And in 70 of those 88 counties, we use the punch card system. In 70? 70. So that's, okay, okay. Right. all right. Now, where there were great differences in how we measure and, and, and count votes and determine votes, uh, was th th those differences were substantial. First, in Florida, uh, they have uh, canvassing boards, which are the equivalent to our boards of elections. Here in Ohio, you have two Democrats and two Republicans. In Florida, you can have one party dominate all three seats, and in most cases, there are two to one breakdown. How, are the, how were those people chosen? I know here, the parties appoint two representatives each, and then if there's a conflict, the Secretary of State breaks the tie. Right. In Florida, yeah. where there were three, how, how did those people get selected? Well, that's, that's the question that I, I really don't know. I didn't really look, okay. in, in, look, right. look into that part the of it. Is, it was the it fact is, it could be all one party. All one party. Okay. And so the, it was, it was the, a, a balance question that was uh, at, at issue there. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that in Florida, uh, they had this general uh, measure of determining the intent of the voter. Uh, in, in Ohio, where we use punch card systems, uh, if you have a chad that's hanging by one corner or two corners, it's a vote. Okay. If it is hanging by only, uh, if there's only one corner punctured, uh, or if the, it's a dimple or pregnant chad, it does not count. And is that in the law? That, that is a directive that has the benefit of law, but a big issue in Ohio now is whether or not we should uh, codify uh, those directives and guidelines and make them hard and fast, you know, elements of law. But you're saying that in Ohio we have directives that would have had a different sort of impact 
if the controversy had been in Ohio than well, in Florida. A standard, in Florida, a yeah, clear standard. In Florida, there wasn't a clear standard. Plus, these counting boards uh, could be dominated by one party, one which party, right. raised the question, at least the appearance of of impropriety. Anyway. A absolutely. So the the other issue that I thought was was a a difference and and, and a real uh, dis distinction is that in Ohio. Uh, we have about 30 days between the election and certification. Uh, in, in Florida, they only had uh, a week. Now, what happened in Florida uh, as a consequence of the protest and the contest was that eventually the Florida Supreme Court cut the contest period in half from four weeks to two weeks, and that contributed to the clock running out mm -hmm. on uh, Let me ask one other Mr. question Gore. about differences. I thought I heard at one point, and I don't know if this is true, that, okay, the, the voting process is the same as in, in terms of puncturing the, the, uh, the ballot, but that the counting machines in Ohio are more sophisticated and they clean chads off the back that are hanging, whereas in, in Florida that didn't happen? Well, what you have is the blower system that can blow uh, hanging chads. Uh, off, uh, off the back and of the And we have uh, that uh, in Florida, in, 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 most of our, in most of our counties that have uh, punch card systems, we had that. But here, here was another difference. You had the, what was called the butterfly ballot. Right. Uh, the reality is that we have a butterfly ballot structurally, meaning that you have a, a, a spine of punch holes mm -hmm. coming down the middle of a page, and you, on both sides of the page you have, uh, on both sides of that spine you have pages that look like a butterfly wing. Mm -hmm. In Ohio, uh, we in fact put the candidates running for one office on the same side of the ballot. Uh, all right. Okay, uh, so uh, all the presidential candidates would right. be on the left. Uh, right. Okay. okay. Even and if it opens up and there's another uh, race on the right. Uh, that's right. Okay. Now the other the other thing that that happens in Ohio is that we rotate the names on the ballot, uh, and in Florida there are fixed positions. And so in Ohio, uh, you 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 distribute the risk. <laughs> you know, across the, the, the candidates. If something is wrong in, the, in that system, that in, in, the, in, in the machine, in Florida, that candidate that has a, uh, a faulty punch by his name gets all of the risk and, and all of the distortions in the, in, in the voting. And let's be clear about that. When you say they rotate, meaning in certain number of pre certain percentage of precincts, George Bush would have been at the top, and, and and Al Gore would have been second. In another percentage of precincts, Al Gore would have been at the top, and George Bush might have been fourth. Right. And you keep rotating those right. all the way through, which is the way it happens in city council races, too. Right. And in field races, that's really important, because if you did them alphabetically, right. or you did them by party, or you just it fixed would really positions. skew them. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. So you're right. saying, that's again, another prevention, but the butterfly ballot structure we do have. We, we do have. Okay. Now, I'm sure, you're th I know, you're th rethinking all of these issues and what Ohio should be doing in the future. I want you to look at a uh, report here that Jeff Hirsch did. Um, you know, although punch cards and chads are the voting method used in southwest Ohio and northern Kentucky, northern Kentucky is more advanced, as 12 News reporter Jeff Hirsch pointed out a month ago. Okay, it's going to be $15. Clerk of Court's Office, Campbell County, Kentucky. Everything from license plates to vote titles to voter registration. And if you're good, they'll give you a dum-dum, which is appropriate because you have to be a dum-dum if you cannot figure out how to vote over here. The judge will push his officer's control button here. It lights up. All the lights inside the machine come on. And that tells the voter they're ready to vote. Computerized voting machines like this are used all across northern Kentucky. Simply press the button for the candidate of your choice. You see that a solid red light lights up right next to it. Contrast that to the old-fashioned punch card method used in much of Ohio and Florida, for example. The punch might not go through all the way, leaving judges to sort through little pieces called chads to figure out if a hole was hit or not. Now, one of the problems down in Florida was people saying they voted for the wrong candidate or people voting for two candidates, which canceled out their ballot. That cannot happen with a machine like this. Let me show you why. Let's say you decide to vote for Pat Buchanan or anybody. You can then not vote for a second or third candidate. The machine will not let you do it. But let's say you're about to leave. You say to yourself, I don't want to vote for that guy. You can undo your vote, and the machine will let you 
Vote for somebody else. When you're finished making all your choices, you hit the green button. And your votes are recorded. These machines here don't have any error adjustment built into them. I mean, the votes are tabulated, and it's 100%. Of course, some people are intimidated by computers and flashing lights. But poll workers are allowed to show voters how it all works. And unlike the punch card system, this one does work, even if you're a, well, you know. Okay. That's the system over in northern Kentucky. It's used in other places around the country. It's used in Columbus and Franklin County. It's used in Columbus and Franklin County. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that system? I think it's a great system. Uh, but one of the things that Jeff's report didn't tell you is that before you push, or after you push the, the vote button, mm -hmm. that's, that's it. There's, there's no paper audit. Uh, you can't change your mind. One of the benefits of the punch card system is that before you drop it, the card in the box, you can actually say, ah, give me another ballot, invalidate this one. You can stand in line, go back in, and, and, and change your mind. There is a, a paper trail and so that you, you, you can audit. In the punch system, it goes right into a chip, and that's, and that's it. So uh, It's just a computerized version of the old voting machine. I grew up in northern right. Kentucky. You used to go in and pull the levers right. and then pull the right. big levers. Things, things have, uh, machines, various voting devices have their front end advantages and, and disadvantages and their back end advantages and disadvantages. You know, I have folks in Ohio now who will argue, look, you know, we in fact have a, a reliable and, and accurate system uh, if you have the standards and the supporting uh, guidelines uh, to, to help you do, you know, narrow races where uh, the margin of victory is within percentages. Well, Ken, what are you going to do? As Secretary of State, I mean, right now, this is on everybody's mind. What are you going to be doing to try to address this issue? In February, uh, somewhere around February 13th and 14th, we're going to convene 14 to 20 uh, scholars, legal experts, uh, uh, election uh, administrators to come to Columbus for an election reform summit. And we're going to, we're going to assess uh, what the situation is in, in Ohio. One, in terms of the standards that we have. Uh, two, in terms of the various voting devices. You know, while 70 of our counties have the punch card system, 11 of our counties have the scanning system, uh, five of our counties have the uh, touch, electronic touch pass systems that we just saw in Jeff's report, and two of our counties have the old-fashioned levers. You know, nobody manufactures the levers anymore. And so it, it, it's really time to, to, to ask the question, uh, should we look f for a conversion or towards a conversion of all of our systems to the electronic touch pass system or the latest state of the art? Well, you know, one of the issues here is if there's a big, if there's a conversion to something other, since 70 counties, 70 of the 88, use the, the punch card. If there's a major conversion, that's a lot of money, right? Yeah. No matter what the well, alternative what, what, what the vendors are saying now, if you look at their rough cut guesstimates, they're, they're talking anywhere from 400 to $500 million, you know, to convert. For the all, state? For the state. Well, so a half a billion dollars. Right. Actually, that doesn't sound as high to me. I mean, for security of this sort of thing, so that we never go through what we went through this. Yeah, but what, what, what happens is that it, it comes down to who pays. And the, the other issue is how does it fit against other priorities? And in the normal flow of things, people say schools are more important, road construction is more important, you know, uh, yeah. 911 systems are more important. So we're, we're going to have to fit it into our, our, our priority uh, order of uh, things that need to be done. Well. You know, priorities and money and budgets <laughs> are always the issue. Right. And, you know, that's, that's something that you're going to be dealing with beginning in February. And people can follow that on your website, by the way. And I'm going to give people the website right. address Super. at the end of the show so Thank they you. know about this. Stay right there. We're going to mm -hmm. take a break, though. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll explore the all-important redrawing of Ohio's electoral maps in light of the 2000 census. Welcome back. Although the media has focused on what the state of Ohio will do with reforming public school financing or reform of the tax code, among the most important set of decisions to be made in Columbus in the coming months flow from the 2000 census. 
By April 1, the Census Bureau will officially inform Ohio of the results of the census. In Ohio, the state apportionment board that will utilize that information is made up of Republican Governor Bob Taft, Republican Secretary of State Ken Blackwell, and Republican State Auditor James Petro. Notice a pattern there? The new voting districts must be approved by the state legislature in time for the November 2002 election. A little background. Over the past 30 years, other parts of the nation, particularly the South and the West, have grown more rapidly than Ohio. As a result, we have steadily yielded seats to, in Congress and the Electoral College, for that matter. In 1970, Ohio sent 24 representatives to the United States Congress. After the 1990 census, Ohio was down to 19 seats with the configuration you see here. The 2000 census will cause us to give up another seat forcing the lines in all of these districts to be redrawn. Nothing is more important to shaping the future of policy than controlling who gets elected. Nothing allows a political party to shape future elections more than the control over drawing the electoral map. And nothing stirs partisan rancor more than redistricting. <laughs> How's that for a setup, Ken, for reapportionment and redistricting? And you're going to be right in the center of this. Um, and this is one of these major you know, decennial sorts of decisions that have to be made. On that congressional map, we are going to lose a seat. At least it, uh, officially it isn't there yet, but we know it. We're going to lose a seat. Um, any guess at this point? I mean, the speculation is that Sherrod Brown's seat, the 13th uh, district, or uh, Strickland's seat, the 6th, are the, the most likely to be uh, to be eliminated. Any any feeling about that? Well, let me let me just add on to what you just said in, in your description of the apportionment board. There will be two legislators on that board. Okay. Uh, one Republican, one, one Democrat. Uh, that's still, a, you know, in partisan terms, a four to one uh, breakout. Republicans control the pen as they did in 19... In 19 uh, and, or, uh, and the first principle about politics, you've got to know how to count. That's right. Okay, <laughs> four, one. Okay, right. go ahead. Well, the, 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 other, the other issue here is that the legislature not the apportionment board will determine congressional districts. The apportionment board will redistrict Ohio state legislative districts. Oh, okay. Okay, the, so the, the legislature will de make the final determination as to the, the lines of the congressional districts. Uh, that is something that I can tell you, I didn't, I didn't fully understand until I was well, running. Well, no, wait a minute now. Are, does the apportionment board not have any role in, in congressional districts? Right. You don't even make a recommendation. That, that is, that is. Oh, the, I apologize. That, I misunderstood. That, 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 that. is, that is the, the, the legislature. Uh, we, in fact, reconfigure. The, now, things being what, what 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 they are, I would imagine that there are let state legislature uh, legislators, uh, House members, and senators that have a real interest in their political future. So, you know, they're going to work. I am sure with their representatives on uh, the apportionment board to make sure that there's, you know, some understanding and congruency. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's take a look. If we could see the congressional map again, um, just for a second, uh, the one we had up before. There we go. You can see that up in the Cleveland area or down in the Cincinnati area, you get some really tight, smaller districts. And, for example, if one of these districts, one of these districts is going to go, whatever it is, the big districts, of course, don't have much population. But if you go down to District 1, which is Steve Shabbat's district in our area, I mean, the, that little blue area that goes over to the Indiana line or mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the suburban areas, there would be ways, for example, even though that, that's a pretty evenly divided district in terms of party registration, you could redraw those lines to make that a lot safer for Steve Shabbat so that he wouldn't even have the sort of really serious challenge. I mean, realistically, from a political point of view, that's what can be done well, with this. Well, that's, that's a good point. Uh, I, if, if I would put on a partisan hat and, and, and a genie's hat and, and say, what would I speculate? You know, I, I think that it would, might be easy to say, Sarnara, Sherrod Brown. See, yeah. <laughs> but 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 in reality, and some people are uh, speculating that, right? But, but yeah, but in reality, why would we want to make him unemployed? <laughs> you know, because he he might be the the chief opponent of Governor Bob Taft. You know, why, and he may well, do that well, anyway. Why, why not why, why not make sure that he has a choice 
between keeping his safe seat, you know, or, or running against or running against the governor. But in the final analysis, I would hope that there is some a more rational approach, less partisan approach to making these determinations. I, I think you're right to be to be perfectly uh, candid uh, that the, the first district and after the 1990, uh, I had a, a, a keen interest <laughs> yes, in how those did. lines were drawn. Uh, and I was shocked uh, that Republicans, instead of making uh, the, the feel more even in the first district, made it more Charlie Lucan friendly. Uh, at the time in anticipation that Charlie was going to hold that seat, you know, for, for decades if, if, if he wanted sort to. Sort of conceding it to him, that's, basically. That's right. So uh, what, what they did at the time was they made it Luke and friendly first, but they said, look, when you look at the configuration and given your popularity in the African-American community, it's just as friendly for you as it is for, 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 for Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> now, but, but so the reality is, is that if you take a little bit from Portman's very Republican district or you take a little bit from Boehner's very Republican district, you can have a configuration there that will even the playing field. You won't make Shabbos district, you know, a slam dunk for a Republican, but, but right now it's, it's sort you'll of make tilted. It, you'll make it a lot more difficult uh, yeah. for a, a Democratic challenger. Right, yeah, Let's right. take a look at the Ohio House of Representatives map, if we can, for its a second here. So this is one where the reapportionment mm -hmm. board does have. Mm -hmm. Now, in our and, and by the way, there are 99 seats in this. This gets redrawn not just because of we don't lose any seats in any other states obviously. This is our own map, but but population moves around. Columbus has uh, grown a lot more than say Cincinnati has or whatever. So these lines get redrawn too. And gee, in this last election over in in this area um, uh, Steve Driehaus won a very tight race, a Democrat won a tight race um, in Delhi area and out in the Forest Park area uh, another tight race that went to a Democrat. Those are the sorts of lines that can be looked at. Uh, uh, am I fair? That's, well, that's what uh, we're uh, going to uh, be looking uh, at? Those, those can be looked at but I think here I've been working with the League of Women Voters and we have been arguing that what you want to take a, a, a look at is compactness. Right. Uh, Which is a uh, U.S. Supreme Court standard, by the way. That's right. And the, the other thing that we, we, we talk about is communities of interest. Uh, and so you, you, you really don't want to gerrymander lines to get a, a partisan advantage, but actually go a, across a lot of communities of interest or you, you violate the principle of compactness. Because it, what, you, what you didn't get is that you might get a Republican, but you, if you have a Republican representing Republican districts or uh, Republican districts with community of conflicting interests, all of a sudden what you get is a schizophrenic <laughs> Republican representative. So, you know, I, I think what we're going to do I could is ask you to name one of those. <laughs> but we I, I'm aware of time. I want to move on to, to one other topic. Um, a lot of speculation that you, were, you served in, in President Bush's uh, the older President Bush's <laughs> administration mm -hmm. back in the late 80s, early 90s. A lot of speculation that you might be, get another call from the President-elect George Bush. Um, would you like one? And uh, what's, your, what's your situation right now is all I can really ask you about Well, that. What, I, what I've told my, my friends who are in the uh, inner circles of, uh, of uh, uh, President of Bush, uh, President-elect Bush's uh, camp, you know, I just say, look, I just want to be a friend of W's. And uh, when, I, when I call, I would like my, my, my phone calls answered. And I, in a final analysis, when I go back to Washington, I tell them all the time, I want to go back the old-fashioned way. That's through the governor's mansion. So I'm on a path uh, for 2006. Uh, and I would hope that in 2007, I would have survived the competition and become the uh, governor-elect for Ohio. Okay, well, that makes it clear. Ken, thanks for being with us. We want to put up the uh, website for people right now, www.oh.us forward slash SOS for Secretary of State, and people can follow what you're doing and what your office is doing in this election reform process. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Happy New Year, or, and a happy Merry Christmas, Thank Happy New Year, and uh, we'll have you back, because i got a here. feeling you may get some calls from Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Have a good holiday, and join us again next Sunday. We leave you with a portion of the Radio City Music Hall Rockettes, who have brought their Christmas show to Cincinnati's Aronoff Center. So long.